song probably has a great deal of meaning to me, and that's not to take away from any of the others that I find to be great. And I find them to be great because of what they say. Most of, one of the most marvelous things a person can say and mean it, I know that my Redeemer lives. Now when you consider what it takes to come to a state of knowledge, <coughs> evidence, credible witnesses, that is saying a whole lot. And once we prove the Bible to be the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the complete, inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God, then it itself becomes proof. And that proof says to me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And thus it makes me want to follow what He teaches. As I'm urged to do, Anytime I study my Bible to see the importance of following the truth of God. And we also sung about the importance of following the Bible. Last week we engaged in two lessons that was dealing with marriage in the home. I want to continue that this morning and for a while into the future. If this nation or any other nation at any time in history is to be able to be the influence it ought to be, it will be because of what mamas and daddies do as they live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony as husband and wife. The example they set and the teachings they do and the discipline both preventive and corrective they do in that home and fulfilling their part that God intended them to fill as far as parents are concerned. Of course, the next great influence is the church's responsibility to preach the gospel to every creature and for us all to live the Christian life as we study the New Testament and understand what it is to live the Christian life. But if there's anything that needs restoring today, it is marriage in the home. Every day, as we studied last week, and I'll not go back over those statistics, Every day in this nation, more and more people reject God, reject His Christ, reject the Bible, and reject the biblical doctrine of marriage in the home. If you look in this congregation, among the faithful here, you will see that we're so far different from the people around about us. When it comes to marriage in the home and our daily plans and conduct, so don't get to thinking because we're around one another so much that the rest of the world like faithful members of the church of our Lord. So far into it. And godly homes. There's so few of them. And godly marriage. There's just less and less of that because people won't listen to God and His Word as to what He approves of. How many people do you think today are asking who are not married in any form or fashion, people who have never been married, and they're asking themselves the question, who does God permit me to marry? They're not asking that question. Not at all. But faithful members of the church of our Lord must ask that question because we're to do only what is authorized by the will of Christ found only in the New Testament if we're to be faithful to Him, Colossians 3.17. God's original plan was revealed by the inspired Moses in the book of Genesis. Genesis 2, 18 and 24, when God created male and female in the beginning. In doing so, He established the divine relationship that we know as the home. I wish people would realize that when a man and a woman who are authorized to contract a scriptural marriage decide to contract that marriage that they're not just promising and vowing to one another, but they're vowing to God, we will operate according to thy will on the matter of marriage in the home. It is God that joins together the man and the woman to be husband and wife, Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. And if they are not qualified according to the Scriptures to be husband and wife, he does not join them together, don't care what man says. The fact that man is to leave father and mother in forming this new home underscores the permanency 
of the marriage relationship. The fact that he is to cleave, as we talked about last week, to his wife emphasizes the great commitment God expects in marriage between a man and a woman in order for them to be godly husbands and wives. We mentioned then that cleave came from an original word that means stuck together and not separated, and each working to keep that stickiness, if you want to call it that. That's not in the mind of people regarding marriage today, and hasn't been for a long time, and of course many don't even seek any kind of marriage, they just live together. There's no authority in the Bible to live as husband and wife unless you are scripturally married. The fact that God joined one man to one woman demonstrates, first of all, that marriage transpires between a man and a woman. You see how that's rejected nowadays. The singularity of marriage, not one man to many women or a multiplicity of partners, but one man for one woman, one woman for one man, living in God's holy estate of matrimony as husband and wife. The fact that the couple, as I've defined that couple, becomes, quote, one flesh, unquote, manifests the great unity that God expects and will exist in a Matthew chapter 9, 6, God-joined, undefiled bed marriage. God's ideal plan is for one man and one woman for life, separated only by death. Now, you know, if everybody had that in mind and knew it was God's will, knew they were subject to God, that God has the right to command them and they have the obligation to obey Him in everything, there wouldn't be so much concern over divorce and remarriage because they would work through thick and thin, through tough times and good times to stay stuck together, according to Matthew 19, 6, as God joined them to be husband and wife. Paul uses this in talking about the church in Ephesians 5, 22 through 32. Marriage is the closest of all earthly relationships and was used by the inspired apostle Paul to indicate the relationship between Christ and the church. There are a lot of people that won't understand the relationship of a Christian in the bride of Christ, the church, to the bridegroom, the head of the body, Christ, because they don't begin to understand the relationship of husband to wife, wife to husband. Listen to what is said back over in the Old Testament in the last book of the Old Testament from the prophet Malachi concerning what has always been God's attitude, even though he regulated some things different over the years and did so in the law of Moses. But you don't see that brought out by the great prophet Malachi. And he was dealing with people as to how lightly they dealt with marriage in his day. In Malachi 2, 14 through 16, Chapter 2, 14 through 16. Here's what he said to the people of his day. And he can say it today and it's just as up to date as anything. Yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Though she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one, although he had the residue of the Spirit? And wherefore one? He sought a godly seed. Therefore, which means the light of everything I've said thus far, we draw this conclusion. Take heed to your spirit, your mind, your thinking, your attitude, your disposition of heart. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For I hate putting away, saith the Lord, the God of Israel. And him that covereth his garment with violence, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, in view of that fact that this is the way God is and his attitude toward these things, therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. You know, to deal treacherously means, I know what God said. But you know, she's 40 now and I think I'd like to get a pair of 20s. Now you know we make a joke about that. 
But you haven't read too closely the Middle Eastern mindset toward women, have you? That's still prevalent today and was prevalent among the Jews. And over 400 years before the events of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the great prophet said to God's people who had been so rebellious all through their existence against God and the law of Moses that this was the way God wanted it between a husband and a wife. And since women had little power over anything, he concentrates on the man because he could treat her about any way he wanted to. So don't deal treacherously with her. Treacherously with her. And you see, we fall under the same condemnation when we will not follow the authority of our Lord and Savior as set out in the words of the New Testament. And we have attitudes and thoughts that are contrary to God's will toward marriage and the home and what they're all to be as far as God's teaching is concerned. And when we begin to have attitudes that are contrary to His Word, then we're beginning to deal treacherously. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So before the treacherous act, there's the treacherous thought. And the prophet aims at the mind and says, get it straight there. And you won't have the treacherous act take place. We must understand that putting away or divorce back in what we would call biblical times because of the culture of that day almost universally carried the idea of remarriage. Jesus, as well as the inspired apostle Paul, both reason that adultery will occur. We don't understand that quite today because a woman had no power over herself. She couldn't go back to school. She couldn't do this. She couldn't do that. She was, if she didn't have a husband, she was at a loss. The mindset regarding divorce or remarriage, I, I hasten to say, is much the same today when you even have so many people not even seeing the need to marry but then to live as husband and wife. And those that do marry for about any reason, they can break it all up. When the Pharisees, as we noted last week, came to Jesus in Matthew 19, verse 3 and then specifically verses 7 and 8, they were trying him. They weren't interested in learning from the Son of God, the will of heaven, that they could obey it. They were interested in trapping him. They were referring to what is sometimes called in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, the Mosaic Concession. Now, in an effort to preserve marriage and for the protection of the wife among the Jews, when they approached God under the authority of the law of Moses, Moses stated what he did in verse, uh, verses 1 through 4 of Deuteronomy 24. Now, instead of just sending the wife on her way, the husband in those passages was instructed to write her a bill of divorcement. Now that's interesting. Because, you know, if he were so upset and mad at her because for the 15th time she burned the biscuits, or whatever she did that he didn't like, that he finally said, I've had enough, hit the road, he had to sit down and cool off enough to write out a bill of divorcement. And in the very nature of the case, in the required time, though it didn't have to be a lot. During this time period, the husband had an opportunity to reconsider his actions, and no doubt that happened. Now you say, well, how do you know that? Because I know husbands sometimes have blown their stack and they walked around outside to cool off and felt bad about it and went back and apologized to their wife. Now, you've never done that, have you? If you haven't, <laughs> you lie about anything else. Moses' instructions were if he gave her a bill of divorcement and she remarried, then he couldn't change his mind and take her back. Even if her husband died. That's pretty strict. The document provided proof of the woman's marital status. For her good, you see. So she was not forced into prostitution in order to be able to survive or to live in a state of any kind of immorality. Because you see, for a woman to survive, sometimes that's all she had. See, we don't understand that quite today, but it was then because she had nothing of herself. She couldn't go out to the community college and 
take a course. She couldn't do this. She couldn't do that. If somebody wasn't there to take care of her, she was at a loss. And the temptation would be too great. And it was too easy to go that sad route. So we must understand that there is a difference in God-sanctioned divorce and in man-made civil divorce. Now, this is a very important point. Not all divorce implies the right to remarry. Now, if you didn't catch it when I said it then, I want to say it again. Are you listening? Not all divorce implies the right to remarry. Not all divorce terminates a marriage in the sight of Jehovah God Almighty. And Jesus shows that if one divorces for reasons other than fornication, they were not. They were not free to remarry. Now, they can go have a court tell them about anything in the matter of marriage. No fault divorce is. If you don't want to be married, you tell the court and drop the papers, and you're not. But that's not God's teaching. And in Matthew 19, 9, he makes it clear. If the spouse is guilty of fornication, then that's the only reason the spouse not guilty of fornication, the innocent spouse, has authority from God to put that guilty spouse away. Fornication is any sexual involvement outside of the husband and wife. Pornea is the word from which we get our word pornographic. Graphos, pornea, to write. Fornication, if you want to call it that. Now, there are two types, two types of divorce that I want to discuss. I've already indicated what it would be. Civil court issued decreed divorces and God sanctioned according to his authority divorces. Civil divorce is arrived at by determining simply this. I no longer want to live with the spouse I currently have for whatever reason, for whatever excuse. I then proceed to file the necessary secular paperwork that the court requires. And I wait for the court to grant my divorce. Civil divorce, listen to me, does not. Civil divorce does not necessarily imply scriptural divorce. Let me go back and remind you that the Bible is very clear when it says concerning civil laws, we are to obey the laws of the land. Just read Romans 13. But there's an exception. If in obeying the laws of the land, I am caused to sin, then I'm to disobey the laws of the land. Because God is the one that has the ultimate authority and it eclipses all of authority because civil law gets its authority from God. It's delegated to them just as the elders of the church have authority from God delegated to them to do what God wants the elders to do is sit out in the New Testament. Same is true of the head of the house, the husband. What authority he has is delegated to him from God as you study it in his infallible word. And so it is when it comes down to any civil law, and that would cover court decrees. If a court decree on anything is contrary and contradictory to the will of heaven, it doesn't change God's law. If it did, homosexuality would be fully acceptable to God right now. But God doesn't say, listen, I mean what I say, and I say what I mean, until the courts down there on earth, a mere feeble men, decide otherwise. Now, you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. In the Greek New Testament, the verb translated to divorce is apoluo. The root meaning is to set free, release, pardon, or let go. And one of the most frequent usages of apoluo in the New Testament of the Christ is in the sense of of setting one free. You might want to jot this down. Mark 15, 15. Acts 26, 32. And Hebrews 13, 23. That word is used to mean that. Now the noun form. And the noun is a person, place, thing. The noun form in the New Testament. Divorcement. Is the Greek word apostostasion. It carries with it the idea of relinquishing property. After the sale of it. Or giving up one's claim to a certain thing. 
Now, in the New Testament of the Christ, both the verb, you know, that shows action, for divorce, apoluo, and the noun, apostasion, continue the Old Testament concept of complete dissolution of the marriage bond. In both Testaments, the Old and New, the meaning of divorce is clearly more than putting away the wife with separate bed and board. It's the granting of freedom for the party to marry again, and that was exactly what was on the mind of those Pharisees when they put that question to Jesus. In fact, if you look at it, remove marrying again or remarriage out of it, it doesn't make any sense at all. They can't even get their point across. They can't try to entrap him where they would like to entrap him. Now, keep all that in mind. Some think that divine law is subservient to civil law. I've never understood that in my whole life of studying the Bible, but some think that because some think anything, especially when it has to do with them getting out from under an obligation of God's Word, giving them freedom to do as they please. So they do that when attempting to apply the teachings of Jesus to various cases of divorce and remarriage. All you have to do is remember civil law is human law. That's all it ever has been. Civil law is human law. And though we normally are to be subject, as I've said, to the ordinance of man, Peter taught that like Paul did, 1 Peter 2.13, such ordinances are valid only in so far as they are in harmony with the divine law, Acts 5.29. If that were not the case, abortion would be acceptable to God. Because the Supreme Court made its ruling in 1973 that it was all right. But we say there's a higher law. And that law is God from whence all laws come from. All authority it was, in, it was inherent in the first person of the Godhead, God the Father. Jesus received all authority from his Father. All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now he had to receive it from somebody. And the only one left is God the Father. Civil law may not authorize that which is wrong or prohibit that which is right. We're taught that one must be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Now, if civil law came out and said, you cannot, Church of Christ, baptize anybody ever again for, unto, in order to the remission of their sins. You know, that just doesn't change the law of God concerning how you get into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. It doesn't change God's mind on whose sins were remitted and when. It doesn't change what Ananias, the gospel preacher, who was picked by Jesus and sent to Saul of Tarsus, to a man who had already believed in Christ and repented of his sins, when he said, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling the name of the Lord. If the man hadn't believed or repented, he could have rose and been baptized from now to doomsday, and it wouldn't wash away one sin. A man must be qualified to be baptized scripturally just like a person must be scripturally qualified to contract in Matthew chapter 19, 6, God join undefiled bed marriage. All marriages are not God joined. And all marriages are not undefiled bed marriages. Civil law, as you well know, may vary in different countries and cultures. It's even varied in our nation in its history. Literally, when the pioneers were out into an area that wasn't even a state, they had some sort of civil law on those covered wagons. And somebody, after being out two or three months, you know, they decided to get married. Well, how, at what point do they become husband and wife? And they actually would say when they jumped the broom, at that point, they declared publicly, we are husband and wife. There's all sorts of ways you can declare publicly that from now on your husband and wife, that's not set in concrete. Have you ever noticed the Old Testament? How did those people in the days of the patriarchs declare that this point forward, we're husband and wife? That's when they had a marriage feast, and he took her to his tent. So you see, it's like sometimes when you're working with people and they want to have a marriage ceremony, they will ask you a lot of times, well, what do we do? And I usually laugh and say anything you want to do. I mean that facetiously, but there is no certain ceremony set out because that's, that's the point. There's got to be a point to where from this point forward we're not single, but we are husband and wife. God has joined us. 
Like one preacher said when he was asked, uh, well, when will we husband and wife? He said, when I tell you you are. <laughs> That's why we say, and now I pronounce you to be husband and wife. Whatsoever God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, when would you say in God's sight, according to his will, that God joined them together? If it wasn't when they were pronounced husband and wife, well, that was the reason they were having the ceremony anyway. If they had the right thing on their mind when they had it, and the vows they make to one another concerning marriage and to God. Civil law then may vary in different countries and cultures. Divine law doesn't vary. It's static and it's stable. Civil law may change due to the fickle dispositions of men. Well, in our lifetime, we've seen that happen. But divine law will remain the same throughout the Christian age. A person who in A.D. 100 was married according to God's teaching of marriage is under the same teaching today that they were then. The late brother Guy in Woods noted this, and I quote him, Divorce is civil, legal action, having nothing whatsoever to do with determining the moral and religious principles involved. It is the Lord's edict, not man's, that governs. And the only reason we abide by man's law is because of Romans 13 and what Peter taught us. You know, it's interesting. In my lifetime, I remember when Jody and I were going to be married. We married in Tennessee. We had to get a, mar we had to get a blood test. We had to get a marriage license. You had to wait so long before you could have the actual ceremony. And it required two witnesses to sign that thing. And it had to be turned back in. Well, when I started performing marriages in Arkansas... I had to go down to the county clerk's office, get recorded in their book, and I had, because it was on the marriage license, I had to write where in that book on what page my credentials were recorded. And so that had to be done. Went over to Oklahoma, and I had to go down to a different, I've forgotten what it was, which clerk's office? I don't remember. It wasn't county clerk. Had to go down there and be recorded differently. And the laws had changed considerably. And believe it or not, here in Texas, anybody that's a member of a church and recognized by that church to be able, that would be the elder saying, yeah, you can perform marriages. That's it. No witnesses. Nothing. Now, if I were to look at this facetiously, maybe not so facetiously, I'd say, Joe, to me, you're bound to get the title and y'all are. <laughs> If you, and that's not it because the laws change. Men can change their laws on things like that. Now when they're binding and they don't contradict God's law, Romans 13 says we obey them in the process of being married. But they can change and they do change and they have changed and they will change. You know, it still could happen to where the government backs off and has nothing to say about any of them. Just let the churches do it. That could happen. And in England, if you get married, you've got to go into a certain building that's registered that makes it legal to have marriages in that building. Or you can't have it just wherever you want it. But you see, we obey that because the law of the land and in obeying it doesn't require us to violate God's law. But they vary all over the place. Jesus, by implication, allows divorce or remarriage for the innocent victim in a union that has been violated by sexual infidelity. Period. Matthew 19, 9. Suppose that the state does not allow one to file for divorce on the ground of fornication or adultery. What if the only allowable civil cause is that ambiguous, irreconcilable differences? Is the victim helpless? The victim, helpless in such a case, must he or she forever remain single simply because civil authority does not specifically recognize the biblical cause? I do not hesitate to say, of course not. Divine law cannot be negated by civil law, man's law, man's will. Now, suppose Jane came home one day and found her husband committing adultery with another woman. 
Jane desperately wanted to save her marriage, and she offered to forgive her wayward husband. But he was not at all interested in reconciliation. He informed her that he no longer loved her, and he left. She waited, hoping he would change. He moved in with the other woman and filed for divorce, which he subsequently obtained. Now, there have been some goofy brethren who have suggested that Jane must forever remain single simply because he initiated the divorce, when he, in reality, is the one guilty of fornication. It is alleged that no, quote, put away, unquote, person is authorized to remarry. She was put away, so she can't remarry. The problem is, she's not the guilty party. She's not the one who committed fornication. God doesn't have an idea or anywhere in His Word that says that no put away person is authorized to marry. Some put away persons are authorized to marry, and some aren't. The truth is, her husband's divorce procedure was not at all authorized by God. It was thus invalid. He had no authority from God to divorce her. She wasn't guilty of fornication, He was. But the law didn't recognize all that, so he got to the courthouse first and got the, the divorce decree. Folks, that happens far more than you realize. But it doesn't change God's will regardless who got to the courthouse first. That the court sanctioned this unjustified action means nothing whatsoever. Any more than the court sanctioning abortion changed God's mind about it. Or the court deciding that homosexual marriages are all right. You think that changed God's mind about that? Jane had ample biblical reason to divorce her fornicating mate. And if she eventually desired to remarry, she has all the authority of the New Testament to do so. For he was the guilty party. And Matthew 19, 9 says, the innocent party may divorce the guilty party, the one guilty of fornication. The fact that he beat her to the court and the fact that the law would not acknowledge her right of divorce, civil law, did not invalidate her God-given privilege for a new pure marriage. Now, it may mean that we have to think some things through. It may mean that we have to be sure we're going to go on the facts in the case and the truth of God and the totality of it bearing on the case. But that's just the way it is. I want to continue with this later, but I hope this, I thought, in fact, when I said it, I'd just stop here because it's a very big thing to get in mind if you're going to be able to understand the Lord's teaching on marriage, divorce, remarriage. So, I want to stop here right at that point. I want to emphasize again, man-made law, whether it's your opinion, whether it's your family's opinion, whether it's traditional, or whether it's actual civil law, if it's contrary to God's will, it has no bearing whatsoever. It is God's will that eclipses and makes null and void the will of man when the will of man, no matter how it's presented, is contrary to God's will. That's true not just in this area. It's true in everything on earth. We ought to obey God rather than man. That's the way that is right and cannot be wrong. If you're not a child of God today, you can be if you want to be. If you're willing to meet the terms of Jesus Christ's great pardon in the power of God to save the gospel. Believing in Him with all your heart based upon the evidence and the scriptures that He's the Son of God. For faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. To continue your obedience and meeting the terms of pardon. To obey the command to repent of your sins. Acts 17, 30. To confess your faith in the Christ. Romans 10, 10. And then you're qualified. I say qualified by God. To be immersed in water by the authority of Christ. Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To obtain the remission of your sins now if you are not willing to do that sad to say but it's true you can't be saved for you must submit from the heart to God's terms of part if you're willing to do so salvation is yours God will hold your sins against you no more when you're baptized for and to in order to the given end of the remission of forgiveness of sins Acts 2.38 as a child of God if you've wandered from his precepts and principles set out in the New Testament concerning living the Christian life, being faithful to him, you have power over yourself to repent and turn from those things. Pray God for forgiveness. And he's promised in his word and his second law of pardon to forgive you as an erring child of God and restore you to your first love. It's all up to you. It's all up to me. Choose you this day whom you will serve. 
you're subject to the Lord's call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.